Biomimicry Guild is a pretty wonderful thing. It's a um, amazing organization and an incredible resource. And one of the things that we can learn from this organization um, involves ways of taking information, ways of seeing it and translating it. Because one of the very big difficulties with biomimetics for designers is how do we address nature? How do we approach nature? We all know nature is important. And we all know that we want to involve a new kind of design strategy that, that involves much more in terms of natural growth and, and natural protection and sort of reforestation of cities and incredible um, new ways of, say, passively ventilating buildings. But how do we do that? How do we begin to invent a strategy? Before we can approach nature, we have to approach design. We're designers. And so the things I would like to sh present and show tonight are experiments. They're projects that have moved in this direction. They've looked at trees, leaves, flowers, and seeds, and we've begun to try and analyze these things in a biomimetic way. And over the last 10 years in, in this city, we've been doing classes at UIC, and then recently, more recently in the last few years here at um, Elizaba, and we have been trying to introduce ways for designers to approach science without being scientists. This is a really important, difficult um, confrontation. Okay, so in the development of and ways of thinking, how do we make a strategy to use nature? How do we begin even to do this? In the work that we're doing and that I've been doing in, in, in my studio is taking these forms from trees and using computation. Most natural functions can be um, translated into algorithms. The algorithms can be worked with in software. Software can then be moved through different other softwares. So the process becomes one of using natural occurring scientific information that is and has been presented, say, by different biologists into mathematical algorithms that work in different softwares. Primarily, the software I use is called XFROG. And what we're seeing here is a series of trees. This is a tree. This is, um, I will come around a little bit in a few more images and explain that. This is Go back. This is the tree branching out of a system. The, le the branches are being directed to grow back into itself, into the center of the structure, creating an, exo an exoframe. And there are points along the frame where computers are embedded, sensors are embedded for controlling these leaf-like forms. But what we're actually trying to do is move away from conventional thinking for what the panels could be, what is a green building, what is a green roof, what is a green wall, and move to what a biological wall could be. How do we introduce biology into this? How do we move from soft design softwares to files that we can build with, files that we can do STL models with, or CNC building, or fabrication? So. First of all, for one second, think of my body as the tree and my arms as the branches, okay? What we're normally used to is a tree that's branching like this and reaching for the sun. And if something happens here, it compensates. The natural organism can move in balance. And there's a, a kind of really wonderful life cycle going on here and, and responsive cycle. How do we put that in a building? Why do we want to put it in a building? Well, in, in order to put that in a building, we have to analyze it. Well, this part of the tree is really not a very s successful architectural element. It's a cantilever, and a cantilever is weak. 
And so you're putting a lot of, you put any pressure here and you lose all. So the tree metaphor isn't as good as it could be. We could use the tree to grow differently. I'm not saying biologically do this. I'm saying do this in computation to grow the branch down gravitropically and have it fuse into the trunk. So you start doing a structure that is much stronger. You try to you try to push me around like this, and I'll go all over the place. You try to push me around like this, and we have strength. And if you fuse the branches, we have double strength. So we start having a system, an anatomy, that we can use in design thinking. Here's X-Frog um, trees, just generated trees. The branches have been turned into tubes, so it looks um, very strange. This is the exact same building. This is the exact same frame. The exact four trees are being represented here. Branches have been turned into this themselves to create columns. And files can be exported for use in STL and CNC fabrication. This is XFROG growing. It's very low res. It's directly from the program. What you see are the branches growing into themselves. The trunks coming together. And some of the resulting STL modeling from these kinds of, of design experiments. But there's a failing point here. If we have a central column, the branches aren't really necessary. We could increase the load of the column. We could increase the weight, the strength and we could just use the column. So we need to evolve from branching systems. We need to do something differently, and I'll come back to that in just a second. When Biomimicry Guild talks about extrapolation of ideas and growing ideas, there are very, very simple tasks that we can begin to, to give ourselves we can give to children, we can teach to all ages of students of ways of looking at nature, at small things that are common. Here we get this really beautiful stacking of cylinders, I'm sorry, of, of um, spheres. We see a structural connector and we see this beautiful protective skin. So how do we start thinking of this as a design inspiration. How do we start using it? What is its value? This has amazing air circulation values. How do we ventilate something like that? I, here in Barcelona, I've been working on a study that is represented here, just on that aspect. How do we use generating through the software, generating these forms to, tr to trace air flows? But it also traces possibilities for passive ventilation, for you know reduced solar gain or increased solar gain. So you start having these biological models that can play into your architectural form. And you don't have to use pods. I mean, these can be transferred to any form you want, any kind of rectangular form for offices or rooms. So my question. To, to you could be, how do you see this as an architecture? What do you see? Do you see it as food, or do you see it as a house for a baby? This is, you know, a baby tree is living here. And we're seeing an amazing thing here. And what do we do with that in terms of design? So. This is a, one of our elementary lessons for beginning students in biomimicry and architecture or uh, our design. And we have this amazing surface. This has relatively crude skin and it's a little bit rough. It lets air in, it lets air out, gases out. It keeps moisture out, but it lets moisturized vapor out. It nourishes the seed inside in a totally different environment, but the very same material. And when you cut this, everyone should go home and do this. It's fantastic. When you cut this, you see what's it doing. It's making a structure that's much more like this. 
the natural mathematics are flowing in, in spirals. And that spiral is called, is part of a, a mathematical formula in botany called phylotaxy. It's the distribution of forms around a central stock. It's the only botanical term I'll give you tonight, but it's one of the important things that there are scientific w informations that we can take out of these sort of forms. So what could we do with this? We could obviously do a panel system. You know, this is an interior skin, an exterior skin, some pieces between for filtration. You could start thinking, I'll put in some computational, I'll put in some high-speed sensors responding to environmental activities. Maybe we'll start putting in some filtration devices, and you have a skin, and you have a skin like an airplane. How do we change that? How do we start moving as designers to being able to think of what's a biological action we can do that's like this? How do we embed bacteria? We just heard Janine talk about bacteria, and it was all in a negative form. There are many, many bacteria that we can use and cellular forms, and there's research going on to bring these into design, the design world. This is a panel system that uses a, a breathing system, a filtration for bo both noise and air, air filtration, and it sort of looks something like that. The panels can be switched out. They're connected back into the same sort of frame that we saw earlier. This is showing right here. I want to come back to the tree. Remember the tree I showed you when I was talking about the central core, the central stalk, and we had to get rid of it? The reason is that if you have a column, the column is good. We don't need to reinvent a column. We need to reinvent ways for active forms, excuse me, active forms in buildings. Maybe things need to move seis seismically. Where I come from in Los Angeles, we have earthquakes all the time. We need a more flexible system. But maybe we need a system that starts to self-shade itself, that starts to environmentally move. So I started kind of um, evolving a tree into a different kind of truss system, into a different kind of design structure that could flex, that could grow branches, that could be be, maybe thought of at nanoscale in a material, but maybe thought of as full scale. This can be developed with a CNC tube bending machine. This is a STL model. It's directly from the software. There's no other design here. Here you see how it's gaining strength in these fusions. And here you see an interesting aspect. And what it is is the embedded other embedded information that comes from the computation and other biological information that then is part of the heritage, part of what's surviving in the digital file. Each of these tips, the information was used for this next stage. The information was collected, was used as a point cloud in Rhino, and the point cloud was then used to generate a glass skin the glass skin was then used and repopulated with a leaf form. The leaf form was finally converted into a 3D form, a panel that took in air from, one, from inside to outside, left spaces for seeing through. You can see this is kind of the morphology of a leaf. And it's calculated. The panels were designed in paracloud, parametric modeler, and the building was analyzed in paracloud as well for, this is just for solar gain um, on the tower, and this is the panels, the, the finished panels as you're seeing them. They're 2,200 panels that are really modeled on the almond, that the skin and the structure of this, this really strong structure, is then used as a skin, as a, a, a monocoque skin for the building. Last slide is, this is a comic book I illustrated and wrote about two years ago for the master students that I teach. It's involving 
the issues of biomimetics, and I'm putting it in now because we're reviving it. It's an iPhone app that will be released in the next couple of months, and what we're trying to do is distribute this information and um, sort of help this profession uh, design biomimicry come into its own to create a kind of base where we can all work from, working toward a kind of architecture and design, industrial design, furniture design, that is has embedded functions from nature, not just copying one aspect, but that we're embedding in na nature's intelligence to get passive reaction, passive in the sense like passive solar, passive ventilation, passive other types of generation from living cells, so that although we've come to accept that massive, massive computation in our lives through Google, artificial intelligence that we all thought 10 years ago was a laugh, we use every day in, in computation for Google searches. AI is part of our lives. Many of us, as we reach a certain age, will have heart transplants, we'll have contact lenses, we'll have these kind of robotic implants put in our body, and we just think nothing of them. We just think that's medical science. But that's incredible. We're putting these machines in us. So we can think of our bodies as an architecture and our bodies as part machines, and we can think of our computational lives as billions and billions and billions of bits of, of search intelligence, but we can't think of an intelligent skin for a building. Why not? Why can't we have a hybrid building? Why can't we have a skin of a building that does photosynthesis, that filters the air, that filters out pollution, but also filters out allergies or allergens? And why can't these sort of things be done in a university and patented by the university? Dow Chemical doesn't have to do everything. We could take our own kind of destiny for materials and for development and start producing things ourselves as designers. And thank you. <laughs>